Today's episode of In the Trenches is brought to you by System 12 Guitar Method. Sign up today at RyanRoxy.com. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 and welcome to another live stream episode of In the Trenches with Brian Roxy. I am your host. Uh, thank you very much for coming in, uh, as we do every Tuesday uh, for our live stream. If you are listening to us on the audio platforms, uh, what are you doing? By this time, you know what I'm going to say. You just, you know, let me see if I can get the point right now. Still can't get that point right. Hit there, hit that subscribe button uh, in the YouTube official channel because that's where we want you to be. Uh, we appreciate you listening to us on Apple and Stitcher and Spotify and all the audio platforms. But uh, if you'd like the true, true experience of In the Trenches, you got to get into the chat. It's the live chat right now. Thank you guys for coming in week in and week out. And we're ready. I'm actually feeling really good today. I mean, it's a week gone by since the Super Bowl. I told you we'd talk about it. I was a little bit paranoid uh, about uh, all my sound issues last week with Teddy Zigzag, but I think we've uh, remedied everything and we are ready to have a kick-ass show. So again, you know what? We always have a kick-ass show when we have a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer on the on the program, and uh, today is no different because it is a pleasure to have another Rock and Roll Hall of Famer on the podcast today. A guitarist that has played with some of rock and roll's biggest names. He's played on some of the rock and roll's biggest and purest hits. He's also deeply involved in the spreading of awareness of addiction, recovery, and hope. He even coined the phrase a recovery troubadour, is what's which what is is what he is. And I look forward to talking way more about that, uh, as well as guitars, as well as rock and roll, as well as New York City. Would you please welcome in the trenches, Ricky Bird? Hello, Ricky. What's happening, man? <laughs> we can both see each other. How about that? I know. I got my purple <laughs> backdrop. You, you have a nice back. Where are you, man? That's a nice backdrop. I'm at actually. I'm in a new location. I'm at the uh, the Hughes and Kenner's recording studios right now today, and that's my that's my hummingbird in the back. And uh, yeah, it's, it's I got my Les Paul, my hummingbird. We're gonna talk all things Gibson because I know you're a big Gibson guy out of the gate, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, I play whatever feels good in my hands but I've, I've always played gibsons i mean i started out playing gibsons for sure i'm a fender guy too i love telecasters do you go with the phrase you play the right guitar for the right song right oh yeah like when i'm doing these records uh i can in my brain kind of can tell uh what like am i going for like like a like a scrappy sound am i going for like a refined sound you know i got a nice 335 that i use for certain things yeah. Um, the only thing I, I'm not a big, uh, Stratocaster guy. Um, I've had some fabulous ones. Uh, like if, if I'm going to use a Fender, it's a telly thing. Yeah. Well, sometimes, you know, you, you can't fake a sound of a telly through an AC 30, right? A Vox, a telly through a Vox or, um, you know, a Les Paul through a Marshall. Those are just sounds that you have to have that sound. If, you, if that's what you're looking for in your head. Right. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, as time moves on, um, the amplifiers get smaller for me, you know. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I use a little F Fender Pro Junior, you know, those little uh, 15 watt guys. When even when I play out live, um, I mean, I started back in the old days, e even before Suze, uh, before uh, Joan, Marshall. I, I think I had a Marshall 100 watt. You know what we used to do? We would take two tubes out back then. Hence, it was uh -huh. a 50 50 watt. <laughs> and to get a little bit more overdrive, it. In, in yeah, 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 yeah. But you. Um, you know, I can't even. I, I can't stand in front of a Marshall anymore. Like my ears, you know, there's some damage, right? Over the time. I, I have a really nice uh, continuous buzzing in my ears now. I mean, it's doable, <laughs> but it's not, it's not pleasant. The but, amps get lighter and perhaps the guitars get lighter. I find with like, you know, the older you get, but it's still, you know, cause taking one of those 1970s Les Paul customs that weighed about 200 pounds, but yeah. sounded so killer, but yeah, I mean, listen, man, my favorite, uh, uh, I don't want to diss the rest of my guitars, but my favorite uh, out, taking, <laughs> out, taking out guitars, well, they've been asking me questions lately, like, why aren't we out playing? 
Um, I have a an Epiphone uh, Flying V. There's a lot of photos of me playing that. You know, it weighs nothing. Um, dude, you you plug that into my uh, little Fender Pro Deluxe. You know, 15 watts. Like you said, I can carry. I can pick it up with one finger, right? Right, why do I right. why do I use that? Well, I was at the Iridium when Jeff Beck played and he just had one plugged in. He had I think he had three of them, but only one was actually being used. And I'm like, okay, well that works. <laughs> you know. So uh I started using those guys. And then I have like a, I have a Vox, you know, I have that like a uh, beige kind of uh, it's an AC30, but it's also louder if you want it to be louder. Um no Marshalls involved. I lost my Marshall in Hurricane Sandy, that the uh, <laughs> old one that I used to use. We're going to talk about all the all that kind of stuff. See, folks that are in the chat, thank you very much for hanging in there. They usually have to wait a little while till we start getting into the uh, gear talk. But right out of the gate with Ricky Bird, you know, we we start getting into the gear. Shameless plug. This is my amp these days. This is the, the newest amp that just came out from Hughes and Gettner, and that's why I'm in the Hughes and Gettner studio. But this little thing's a 50 watt amp. Can you believe wow. it? You know, yeah. two channels and it's, and it's, it's not, you know, power and everything. So, um, you, you play the right guitar for the right song and you obviously wear the right shirt for the right podcast. Cause there it is. Well, I noticed you know what? It right off, right out of the gate. I, I was reading, what was I reading last night? I was looking through, Oh, it's, I think I was on just Facebook and, um, I just came across a post by, um, Yvonne, who was Mickey Ruskin's wife, Mickey owned, uh, Max's Kansas City, the first generation of Max's. And uh, it was just a whole article about it, about who used to hang out there and stuff. And it just brought me back. I think there's a new book out or something. But uh, literally, Max's Kansas City was where I made my bones, my rock and roll bones, right? And as a 16, so 16 year old. Like, I mean, I was going in there and Mickey was a trip, man. Mickey was like rough and ready, raggedy guy with a, like a gold tooth. And he owned the place and he loved artists. So even before the, the like, so I'm talking about 73, I was 16. Like even before that, because it opened, I think at 65, it was a place where artists could go. It was in a weird neighborhood. I mean, not now, but back then there was like no traffic. And at night it was dead, right? Lower par Park Avenue. I had no idea they even reopened it. I just figured that was like from the old school. Well, no, it's not open now, but yeah. I'm, I'm so, so uh, um, Mickey would, um, so he opened this place. So before my, my generation went there right early the 70s. 70s the the early 70s max's kansas city yeah it was all rock and new roll. york dolls and alice well, cooper actually played there as well and yeah it was a it's a, it was sort of a transitional phase because before that uh, 65 to to that time 71 is it was like a lot of painters poets artists and he loved them so they he would have like an open tab for them they'd come in and eat for free they would <laughs> trade their artwork which is what wound up hanging in Max's a lot of that stuff. Uh, for so for it was meals. basically like the comedy store in Los Angeles, you know, for comedians. This was for musicians and yeah, artists. yeah, yeah. And then mm -hmm. and then when I started going there, well, there was a place. There was a place that was before that. We used to go to a place called Nobody's, which was on Bleecker Street. And no, but dude, you go in there and like Jimmy Page was sitting at the bar, you know, like it was. We used to just and I had phony proof because I was just a little. I was a little kid from Queens at that point, <laughs> moved from the Bronx to Queens, right? And, um, right. and then we went, then we started hanging at Max's and, you know, Max's had the best jukebox. I mean, I can close my eyes and see myself hanging by the jukebox or, or, you know, hanging by the bar and then the doors swing open on a hot August night and like David and Angela Bowie walk in wearing matching white suits or something. I mean, it's like crazy. <laughs> I remember That's talking crazy. to Rod Argent from Argent at the, you know, I wow. could close my eyes and, and see, um, all the people that used to hang there. And, and, and funny, um, one of the things that happened there was, uh, I remember seeing Mott the Hoople in 1974 at the Eurus Theater, right? Uh, th I think it was three nights and Queen opened. It was Queen's first show, shows in New York. Wow. And, and I was a huge Mott the Hoople fan. Um, and, and so the deal was like, you went to Max's because when there was a big band, uh, well, here's, here's, the, here's the timeline. If there was a big band playing like, at the Garden or something like that, so you'd go to Manny's Music on West 48th Street because yeah. in those days, you know, the, the crew didn't go down. I mean, they would go down, but like the, whoever the guitar player was would go down. They'd, They'd like, actually let, walk down there because it was such a famous street. Yeah. yeah. And, and they would go there and you'd see them playing. So, I, you know, that's how I met Leslie West down there and this and Ronnie Wood. I, you'd see them. We were just kids, man. We were just so we would go into the city to go to Manny's because we, we knew this band was playing at the Academy of Music or the Garden or whatever. 
we pick up a copy of uh, Melody Maker, right? The music paper. Yeah, and then and then that night after the show, we knew that all of the musicians would congregate down at Max's. So like if the musicians went down there, you knew there'd be like girls down there, right? So we kids went down there. And uh, and so I remember when, so when Martha Hoople played there, they had a famous round table in the back room where they would put the actual rock stars. And I remember standing around that table. I talk about this with my friend Phil, who, you know, uh, we were in the same band back then. You guys talking about, are you talking Phil Fight? No, 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 no. Okay. Right, That's right, way right. later. My friend Phil Bader. Thought I just dropped. I just thought I dropped. We were name, we yeah. were in bands back then. In fact, we played like Flushing High School in 1973 together, nice, um, and so we we talk about this. Like we would stand. So Ian Hunter and, and you know Mick Ralphs and like Martha Hoover was sitting at this table, and we were standing around. We would stand around the table, right, <laughs> like idiots, just staring at them. You know, and then 20 years later, uh, I'm, I'm Ian's, Ian's guitar player on a tour. You're, you're in his band. I was just going to say, man, because you end up playing with the idols that you, you know, sort of hung around their table. You were just loitering and then you got the gig. I love it. I was it. loitering. <laughs> I'm a loiterer. That's me. Well, see, here's the thing, Ricky. We have a really great piece of animation that usually starts the show where it's a part, a piece called You Gotta Go Back to Get Forward. And we're already going back because it started with Max's Kansas City. My sort of New York groove and my New York experience was on McDougal, but mine was a little, a couple years later, and it was the scrap bar. But you probably are no stranger to the scrap bars as well, right? Yeah. Been I mean, I think by the time the scrap bar was around, is the scrap bar where uh, the Stones did that video? No. It was Bleaker, Bleaker and McDougal. It was right around Bleaker. You know, I don't think they could have even, they can't fit really all five members. Of well, it was a very small there. bar. I, I, waiting on a friend. We, we, we got to Google that and find out where well, they that was. That was St. Mark's, right? That was somewhere down was St. Mark's. I, I think well, that's so. where they filmed the outdoor stuff. But then remember, they wind up in a bar okay. at the end of that. A very small, tiny little place. But the scrap, the scrap bar, yeah, I was there a couple of times, but um, I was already on the road. Uh, no, you, you, what, what year were you talking about? I'm talking about late eighties. So yeah, you know, already yeah, at that point. There. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But let's at least run the animation for this segment of the show because it's called Let's Get Back to Get Forward. Let's get it. See, I get a royalty with every motorcycle sample, so that's the reason why we play it. But um, yeah, you, you we talked about New York. You're from the Bronx originally. I didn't know Queens because I I lived in Queens. I lived in Astoria. I lived in Long Island City, and you know so anywhere the seven train would go. I think. Well, yeah, the seven train was my train, <laughs> right? We would, uh, yeah. So we moved from the Bronx. We lived right up the block from Yankee Stadium, up the hill. And I lived there until I was about 13. We moved to Flushing. So I started like junior high school. I was in Flushing already, Queens. Right. And, uh, you know, That's I seven was, train. Yeah, the seven train. And it was, a, it was a bit of a walk to Main Street from my, my uh, I lived on Northern Boulevard, right? So it was a bit of a walk. And man, how many nights did I come home from Max's Kansas City at three in the morning? And I'm being conservative. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and have to, you know, you'd get off the, the seven train and dude, I'm wearing like platform boots and oh, yeah. velvet, a velvet suit and scarves and my hair's all you know you're doing new york dolls back album cover i love it that's flushing <laughs> high school that photo now there was a band one of the first bands rough stuff that was mm. you that was one of the first bands you were in w right. was this during that era yeah and phil as i mentioned phil was in the band my friend phil henry aldi simone um i, I can't maybe louis was louis the other guy in that photo that live photo um yeah, we, we played Max's, we played the Mercer Art Center, we played Coventry out in Queens where Kiss started. Um, I mean, we all played the same places, right? I was just, we were just younger, like like I'm a little, a couple of years younger than the guys in Kiss. Exactly. But um, yeah, so we played all those joints. In fact, Rough Stuff, uh, you probably have that little article, right? I posted that article a long time ago. I think um, our producer Vic has a little bit. Oh, he's 16, shaking his head. He 16, does. Sixteen-year-old guitar player. <laughs> we played. I remember we played at uh, Kenny's Castaways. Now there's one on Bleecker, right? But there was one uptown on the east side, and that's the one we played. And I'll never forget, bro, because Henry played a, a B three, 
And dude, it wasn't just a little keyboard with sounds. I mean, he played a B three. No, the, so, the the full on yeah Hammond with the Leslie B3 cabinet organ with the Leslie <laughs> cabinet, and we had to like lug it in right and lug it up <laughs> steps and all this shit. Um, we all did that, and and we played. And I remember that um, Johnny Winter and Phil says Edgar Winter. They were in this. It was a small club, and they were sitting in the crowd. And there's a picture of me playing my my old uh, fifty six Les Paul Junior, which I got rid of, you know, forty years ago. Um. Mm. And Johnny and Edgar, were, I remember Johnny was wearing a top hat and a cape or something, you know, and we were so excited, but he wasn't there to see us, see? They weren't there to see us. Willie Dixon was on after us. Now, at that point, I didn't even know who Willie Dixon was. Like, you know, I didn't, I didn't, like, delve into that until I read, you know, Keith Richards talking about Muddy Waters and Willie Dixon, and, you know, that's how it works. It gets passed down. Exactly. Folklore. So, there's, not, there was no, there's no internet. There's no Instagram at this point. This is all just uh, fables ho handed down towards musicians. Yeah. And we're, you know, we're, after we finish, we're loading out our equipment and, and Willie Dixon's up there playing like some of the biggest blues songs ever written. And we're like, oh, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. He's doing cover songs. It's like, no, no, no. He wrote those. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's that's the thing about your playing, Ricky, is that you have these big influences of stones, faces, but then there's some glam influences oh, with glam. Sparks, Bowie, for instance. And, and, and Sparks is one of those bands that I feel is a huge influence for a lot of pure rock and rollers, but right. I, I don't think they get the credit they deserve to the mainstream because it's, it's, it's viewed as more of a pop act where it's 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 kind of a rock punk sort of well, but first of all they weren't that big over here see right they were big over there now now gary glitter uh and sweet they had big singles here as well right well, yeah, Ballroom yeah blitz you know fox on the run fox on the run and then you had slade i i saw slade you know a half a dozen times yeah. um so I guess it depends. Like you have to remember, like I was completely entrenched in British rock and roll. So like, like I said, we go into the city every weekend and we would buy sounds, paper, you know, the big papers, the British papers. Uh, yeah. And we, and we'd buy Melody Maker and you would read about all these bands that nobody knew about. So in fact, when we played that, that picture of me playing Flushing High School when I was 16, we opened up with Four Day Creep by Humble Pie. Like, you know, damn, that's another thing. I wound up being friends with Steve. That's great, Steve. Mary, you're one of my favorite bands. Well, the thing is, I know you have those those UK influences. I think Hell a lot yeah. of classic guitar players do. But you're this kid from New York, and you got the American in you, and you have this power pop sort of mentality as well. Maybe it's the radio. I'm not sure what it was, but what? it's the years 1977. You guys are you you have a band called Susan, and 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 to me. It screams of like raspberry yeah. and maybe a couple of years later, I think the replacements probably listened to a little bit of Susan in, you know, before they started forming because this album, know about that. it was a great find that I, I was able to listen to the entire album this Good morning cover too, huh? on this. I really love this album. It is Susan 1977 folks. You know how much I like that year. You're 21 years old. That it was that your first record, like legit record deal. Yeah. I mean, I got my first song covered as a songwriter right around then by a band called Photomaker. Um, and Photomaker was another kind of pop band. And it had a couple of guys from the Rascals and it had a couple of guys from the Raspberries. Right. Uh, and I saw I remember seeing the Raspberries in Central Park and those singles were huge uh, on AM radio. Go all the way. You know, I want to be with you tonight. Of uh, course. Uh, um, so, I mean, my musical uh, landscape is, like, huge, right? right? Because AM radio, and you have to talk about AM radio here in New York, um, as opposed to now where, like, um, uh, like XM, Sirius Radio or something, there's a station for each genre, correct? Right. You know, I mean, Little Steven plays, like, everything. But most of the stations are, like, there's a Bruce station. There's an Alice station. There's a this There's station. a Pearl Jam station. Yeah, there's I a blues. It. There's a yeah. blues station. There's a, you know, there's a Sinatra station. But AM radio, uh, and I only can only speak to New York, is, um, uh, you know, you would hear in, like, 15 minutes, you'd hear, like, uh, The Stones, Sinatra, Trini Lopez, uh, um, uh, Wilson Pickett. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, it was all on one station. So I like, gotta I, tell you, brother, I learned I, all that stuff 
from being a radio kid. I I say the same exact thing, brother. And I know you grew up in New York. I I'm, I grew up a couple years later, not that many years later, but just a couple in on in the Bay Area in San Francisco. And I always credit AM radio. KFRC, Dr. Don Rose, actually, for turning me on to bands like Aerosmith, who would play right next to the Commodores, who would play right next right. to Cheap Trick, who would play, you know, is it, so it was constantly disco, rock and roll. Disco yeah, so roll. if you hear anything that I do on my uh, albums, my solo records, you can hear, I mean, I, I don't hide anything. Like, I wear my influences on my sleeve on purpose, and I give a nod to certain things. It might be a Steve Cropper riff or a uh, you know, humble pie, Steve Marriott, like so uh, singing shout or something. But, um, but you know, with like, we're talking about us, but what about like people like Elvis and those people, you know, they would be listening to the blues, uh, the soul uh, stations that they would get from four towns over. And that's exactly. what turned them on to, uh, you know, black blues and, <laughs> and soul. So for me, I heard the, um, like I mentioned, you know, the temptations and the four tops and wilson pickett and al green no yeah. deep cuts right it was just top 40. i didn't learn about the st other stuff the the like elmore james and and robert johnson until i became a rock fan and i have which i still have all of my magazines all my cream circus, circus you know, rock magazines. Things. yeah i have them all still um, <laughs> but I would read this one talking about this and this. Oh, who's Elmore James? Oh, right. Let that was our this. musical internet back then. Circus Magazine, right. Dream yeah. Magazine. That's how I found out about any sort of band. Yeah. Or even Jay Giles. Like you would read, uh, you know, Magic Dick, you know, on the Lickin' Stick, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And he'd be blowing a harp and you'd read something on him and he'd talk about like Slim Harpo or, you know, Junior Wells. And it's like, well, who's that? And then you'd go back and you'd find Junior Wells. And I think we do as, as adult rock people we do i mean at least i try to do that too when i do interviews i try to like i tell my kid it's like she's 19 i say you know you you're supposed to like different music than me but it you should knowing the history of music like where all this came from it's imperative uh for your your like <laughs> the lane you're in you know it, it's good to know where this started where that started you know how cool is it though for you to have all these influences and not only do you get to meet most of them, you get to jam with a lot of them because you just mentioned Jay Giles. I'm thinking you you already, you know, I think Vic might have a picture with you and Peter Wolf. And, yeah, that was, uh, I was just going to see his show, that. But I did, um, I mean, the, the night of the induction in 2015, uh, yeah, I mean, how, I, I can't, I saw, I saw uh, the Jay Giles band, um, and it's a shame they're not in the rock hall, but they will be eventually. Um, I saw them easily over a dozen times you know when i was a kid I, jay giles was one of the finest rock and roll bands america's produced you know <laughs> uh and um with with very heavy soul references you know but um if you look at the the final the night of um the induction the uh the the, the end jam right so this, yeah you, uh, you where when you guys were just inducted yeah, yeah. recently in 2015 yeah okay yeah so, you know, that last thing. So, you know, you got Gary Clark Jr. Now I got to close my eyes to see. I think Anton Fig on drum, Ringo on drums, McCartney, uh, Billy, Billy from Green Day. Green Day, yeah. Um, There's a great um, picture that you don't even have to open. You can open your eyes now because that's yeah, yeah. reality, folks. That's, a that's good And that's Paul Schaefer in the back. He was telling everybody who was next for the solo in I Want to Be Your Man. Uh, and and um, but But to the left of me, to the left of me, yeah. To the, Joe Walsh was standing next to me, but then you had Stevie Wonder, Patti Smith, uh, Peter Wolf. Uh, who else was there? That's a pretty couple of more bridge, people yeah. over there. That's you a know. Pretty damn so when bridge, people yeah. say, "Dude, you played with Paul McCartney," then I said, "Yeah, but but dude, Stevie Wonder was playing harp like five feet from me to on my <laughs> left." You know, <laughs> it's crazy. Well, for folks that are listening to our podcast on the audio, what are you doing? You want to come into our uh, Ryan Roxy official YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button and get in the chat because you get to see uh, exactly what we're talking about, all these stories that we have with Ricky Bird here, our guitarist and our guest. And um, of course, we are talking about that. Uh, a couple of things that you need to do, folks, a little bit of homework. If you don't already have a pen and paper right now, writing all these amazing names down, uh, you got to go check out the uh, Susan record 
from Ricky's first album that he made. And the song, I Was Wrong. I really like that song, I Was Wrong. Go check out that. And also, you might want to check out, because he's a hell of a speech uh, maker as well, you might want to check out Ricky's uh, acceptance speech for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I, I was, hey, watched it this morning and I had myself a good laugh and I thought it was just a good old fashioned New York Fuck yeah. yeah, congratulations. Very New York. <laughs> and I, I was, I worked really hard. I remember uh, Tommy James, like after the, uh, the the next morning at breakfast, Tommy James go, hey man, who wrote your speech? I'm like, dude, I did. I mean, I sat there and worked on it. They told me how long I had. And, you know, like I, I like, uh, I'm a big comedy guy. Like I love comedy going back to the 30s and the 40s. So yeah. like, I really, I, I was, I attacked that like Neil Simon, man. I was like fixing stuff and editing. Like I was writing a song. Like I, I wanted to <laughs> laugh and I, there's the a two, little Howard Stern peppered in there as well. <laughs> maybe the the two things at the beginning, uh, you know, the thing I said about Joan, and 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 when I picked up the award, when I picked up the award, and I said, "Hello, baby, I've been waiting for you." That's like totally Dean Martin. There That's what go. that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, and the thing that the the, the more <laughs> remark I made, you know, I was just in a funny, I was in a funny mood, and 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 Miley made a comment. See, you don't see the context of it. Miley said, the first time I wanted to sleep with Joan, you know, so like in my brain, I started going around. And I'm saying, OK, what could I say? What could I say? <laughs> you know? Now, did that cause more? Because to me, perception is reality. But I felt that that comment, it, it's you. It's just you being you. And, and of course, today in 2021, if you say something like that, you'd be canceled forever. And you'd be banned from the Internet. But, you know, to me, it's just Ricky being Ricky. I think I even think Joan caught the joke but but joan was being kind of just like you know she had that look on her face for a lot of what the whole speech was you then you mentioned iggy pop and she starts then she cracks a smile she cuts but i didn't sense any complete no, animosity no. i mean they might, i think there was like one you know joan fan that like you know tried to attack me on you know <sighs> social media or something it's like dude Take a breath, man. You know, you played in a band together. Okay. Now, yeah. now, this is coming right out of, I mean, not right out of, but a couple of years later, because this is 77. And in 81, you know, you joined the, the Black Hearts and you're a Black Heart from 81 to, to 91. 91. A, good, a good decade of playing with it. So, so if anyone's hung out and jammed, you know, with another musician for 10 years, I think they kind of know each other's, you know, sense of, you know, humor and they know each other's vibe at that point. Right. Yeah. I mean, really, it's not even worth talking about, no. but I, I, I will say, add some, something else to the context. They couldn't hear you. You couldn't hear what the person was saying when you were standing back there. So those two things, I said, the thing I, I said at the beginning was ad lib, but the, the rest of my speech and everybody's speech was up on a monitor right, right in front of us at the back of the hall. So we could read it. Cause they didn't want you to like look down. Right. So, so the point being is like, she didn't really hear, they didn't even her, hear, even no, they hear didn't the hear comments. me. That was just kind of her look that that's the whole thing. And, and like the I reason said, why folks, they laughed her in the, the Iggy and the other stuff I said is because it came up on the monitor. On see? the monitor. Yeah. See here, here's the vibe, dude. I, I feel that you guys, you had such an eloquent speech. You gave such high props to everyone in the band. And you and you even mentioned about Tommy Price being in there, which I thought was righteous. And I think it was the correct thing to say. So I, fig I feel that, you know, like I said, that speech, and, and it is in context because Miley was, was said is something as well before the show. So, you know, that was the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And then you yeah. get to jam with Mar McCartney. And, and I let's wanna... face it, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it's like a friar's roast, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's <laughs> like, I, you know, I forget that it's going to be on TV or stuff. I'm just, it's just like, no. we're rock I, I honestly don't what do you think want me anyone's... to be proper? It's like rock and roll. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Oh, you had a great speech. You had a great speech, <laughs> man. I, I love it. And, um, you know, that's just, that's just a couple of the names that you've played with and doing your solo albums because it was um, after that time that you started doing, you've up to four solo albums now. Of course, we're going to get to the newest uh, Sobering Times, which I listened to over the weekend. Um, I really like that album too. I think I actually sent you a, a message yeah, you over did. the weekend saying, man, I'm really digging on it. The, the guitar tones folks on this album. They're pure. 
You know, oh, you can, yeah. and, and, and everything you, you wear your, uh, like you said, you wear your influences on your sleeve. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but I just want to, you know, before we break into the, uh, halfway point of the interview, just want to thank you one for coming on the air, Ricky, and uh, being with us today and sharing your stories. Um, just a few of the other names that you've played with over the years or recorded with or toured with, you know, they're just insane. You know, Bruce Springsteen, you know, Paul McCartney, you saw Elvis Costello, huge fan of mine or huge, huge fan of mine. I'm a huge fan of his. And of course there's this other strange guy, Alice Cooper. Oh, I saw that name and I was like, <laughs> yeah. how did that happen? Well, so first of all, um, you know, when I left the Black Hearts, I immediately went and did this um, record with Roger Daltrey. Uh, so which we hit, recorded half in New York and half at Abbey Road. So that was that. And then we went on a little radio tour. Uh, after that, um, I got a call from Ian Hunter. And he's, you know, I'm going to Scandinavia and England. Um, do you want to come with me? And then we picked up a, a, a preset band in Scandinavia, the rest of the band, um, which I think you showed a picture of. And so that was that. And then there was like a long period where I was trying to figure out what I sounded like, you know, and I put some rock and roll bands together. It never quite clicked. You know, I mean, I wasn't there as a songwriter uh, for myself yet. Like I was writing songs. I had a publishing deal or two. Um, and uh, there's a good shot. But but I was trying to put together rock and roll bands. So, you know, I had a band with Eric Stacy for a minute. Um, uh, um, from um faster pussycat really you um, and Eric Stacey well, he, band lived in, he lived in new york yeah so it was just a little three-piece but i couldn't uh, it was all like tag job stones like i couldn't really find who i sounded like it or what i was supposed to sound like who i was uh there's a good one mick taylor my friend frank carrillo um uh so so that that was a bunch of years right and then um I started to, and then I did a little run with Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes because Bobby Bandiera, his longtime guitar player, went out with Bon Jovi when Richie left. See, everything's connected. So of South always South, gets connected with the New York, New York guys, man. So South called me, said, "Hey, man, you want to?" Nah, nah, nah. So I did that for about a year and a half, um, and then the 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 reason I've played with Mavis Staples and Elvis Costello and you know uh, uh, Sam Moore from Sam and Dave and Alice and you know. Is is because I'm I'm one of these guys that's always in these like um, charity benefits. <laughs> I'm always in the band, so well, I, I get to good work with that. I get to back up um, all these cool people. To me, it's more fun. I mean, yeah, it'd be great to have uh, a rock and roll band and, and, and support these records, but I mean, it's way expensive now, and 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 who the hell knows if you could even stay alive doing it. But with that said, um, it, it's as a musician. Each of these events, I've got like, you know, okay, well, you're playing with this one, this one, this one, this one. And it's all over the place. It could be Alice, and then it could be the guy from the, the you know, the impressions, you know. Like right. it could be. So you, as a guitar player, man, you got to really, um, it keeps you on your toes, learning all these different styles or real, like, re, you know, woodshedding all these styles. And it's always like a variable of the same band. It's me, Liberty DeVito on drums, uh, Jeff Carlisi from 38 Special. Uh, Rob Arthur, who plays with Frampton for the last 20 years. You know, sometimes Paul Schaefer's involved. Sometimes Will Lee is involved. Uh, yeah, there's my pal right there. Uh, and that was just an event, see? That was a, an event at the a winery, and I came up and I did Be My Lover. That's what that was. All right. Huh. That's but, strange. I, I, didn't, so, I didn't recognize him in the middle there. I didn't know that it was. <laughs> just joking. That, so uh, we, um, So I get to play with all these people. Now, so I'm doing this event uh, in Boston for my friend Woody Geisman, who um, runs a treatment facility up there uh, called Right Turn. Um, and it started with si Simon Kirk called me from Bad Company. And, and uh, sorry about the name dropping, bro. But this, this, No, <laughs> you just dro go I, completely drop because there's to. people out there in our chat right now with pe paces, uh, paper and pen taking down all these yeah. names because this is a rock and roll education right now. Today. So Simon says, I'm doing this. Simon says, how do you like that? <laughs> He says, we're doing this event up in um, uh, uh, Boston. Do you want to come um, be in the band? So I'm like, yeah, yeah, cool. So we did it. It's like Simon, I think it was Chad Smith from the Chili Peppers. I mean, uh, we did it a couple of years in a row. Uh, and then one year it was uh, Alice. 
Uh, and actually, right. Carol, my wife, Carol uh, Kay, the publicist, got Alice yeah. because she was doing his publicity then. Yes. And um, so, dude, for me, it was like I was playing with oh, and Damon Johnson, of course, my yeah. pal Damon. There you go. Um, who I call Hillbilly, and he calls me New York. <laughs> Day Joe. Yeah. And, Everybody uh, loves Damon. That's, oh, that's he's the, the nice, he's word a on the street. Yeah, he's a good, <laughs> such a good heart. But um, so that gig, man, I got to play freaking. I mean, I know you've had your experience with this, but like as a kid that like grew up on uh, the telephone is right. You know, I mean, that's what I listened to when I was 14, you know, and then all of a sudden you're playing it with them. And it's like pretty, pretty sick. You know. Well, the thing is, you know, I just I, I wasn't sure who who that person was. Um, so I actually gave him a call and asked him if he might want to come up and clarify exactly who he was because I I, I just know him as a stalker of the podcast. But uh, would you please welcome that bass player dude that wants to explain? It's like uh, the, la there, it's like the oh, Larry King the show now, is it? Look, there it is. There's your <laughs> surprise guest right there. There's your gotcha moment there, Ricky. Uh, please welcome to the show, uh, to the podcast, Mr. Dennis Dunaway. Hello, Dennis. How you doing? Hey, Ricky. What's up, brother? Dennis uh, is such a, Dennis is a sweetheart, man. He's a great guy. We've played together maybe twice, um, and he's just such a, a good-hearted guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a great night at the city winery. That was, yeah, that was uh, November thirtieth, uh, two thousand eighteen. And that place is gone now. Like they moved it. Yeah, they I, haven't were, been, I haven't been to the new place yet. Yeah, the timing kind of worked out for them concerning all of the clubs shutting down because they were going to shut down and move anyway. Yeah. And, uh, and you know what's great about that place, the winery? It's got a, a great uh, green room downstairs. So, like, we were all at downstairs telling stories, see? Yeah. You know, and Garland, that, was that the night Garland Jeffries was there? Garland or? Jeffries was there. Uh, oh, my God. Uh, Tish and Snooky sang with us. Yes. You know, yes. they sang with everybody. And uh, Jay, now, Tish and, just so Matthew. you know, I don't know if you know who Tish and Snooky is, uh, Ryan. They're from the Maxis, Kansas City. Era. days and those bands, you know, and all of the Mercer Art Center. Go ahead. That's just my yeah. comment. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Maxis, Kansas City is where uh, Bob Ezrin uh, saw the Alice Cooper group. But they, it hasn't reopened, but they did for the Scorsese thing, uh, vinyl, that series. Right. They yeah. recreated it at a different location right around the corner. And people that went there said that it really looked like the uh, original one. Hey, and let I me really say, like there were many nights that there was nobody in there. Uh, it's like, the, it wasn't a party every night. Yeah. Like the night we played there and Bob Ezrin was there. <laughs> yeah. They, they, you'd go there. There'd be like four people at the bar or something like that. But when it was yeah. really hot, like on a weekend night, it was filled with rock and roll women and rock and roll guys and, all crazy shit going. There was characters in there that were, there was a guy named Eric Emerson that used to like run across the tables, like without his shirt. Like it was all kinds of stuff going on. Oh yeah. Uh, and they had that red laser beam in the early days, yes. of laser beams. And so you'd be walking down the streets of New York city, which weren't all safe in those days. You had to be street smart, but you'd see a laser beam that was up, you know, about 10 feet up above ground level. And you'd follow it and they'd go down the street and it'd bounce off a mirror and go around the corner and you'd follow it for blocks. And then it'd go <laughs> into the club and up the stairwell to, to the venue. Yeah. And let me, let me say Mickey Ruskin, like every time me and my friends, so here's the deal. They pick me up in Queens. Um, I would come down with a, um, I think I'd come down with like a six pack of beer um, we would take, uh, uh, this is just between me and you and anybody that's listening. <laughs> we, we would take quaaludes, see quaaludes. Um, and we'd have a bottle of Southern comfort. Okay. And by the time we got to the city, we were completely, you know, we were in our cups as the saying goes. Um, and then the thing was, is Mickey going to let us in tonight? Right. Because we were just like Queens guys, like in, in like velvet suits, like we were just rock guys. I mean, the dolls were the big thing then. Correct, yeah. Dennis? Oh, yeah. Right. So yeah. they ruled the place. Right. The, and, and anybody that was playing in town. And we were just we were just kids that wanted to come here, 16, 17 years old. So so every every time it was like a whole conversation with Mickey. Oh, come on, Mick. Come on. Yeah. 
No, no matter what night you were there, he'd say, no, only girls tonight. No, only couples. No, only, right? <laughs> so, Dick, one holiday night in, in, in my parents' house in Queens, right? We're having holiday dinner. My uncle Don is there, Donald Cantor. And, and he says, you ever go to Max's Kansas City? I said, yeah, yeah. I love that place. I have a hard time getting in. Well, I sell liquor to the place. I'm the liquor salesman. Mention me to Mickey. And I swear to you, the next time I went, hey, you know, Uncle Donald Cantor is my uncle. Well, come right in, son. The, the, the seas parted. Yeah, and then I was always allowed in. <laughs> All right. Well, luckily, the statute of limitations, it, 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 we've reached that with, uh, you know, being in the cup, so to speak, because we are going to talk not just about your guitar journey, but your journey with sobriety, recovery and hope and everything you've done since then. And obviously, you have a tale to tell about it. So we're going to get into that. I just wanted to have Dennis come on and just, you know, fa uh, favorite of the podcast, the 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 um our our chat loves him everybody everybody loves him and he's i'll tell you ricky he's got the way that he does the readers and the sunglasses I saw that. he's got the trick you see that he's got that double that double thing going so now you see yeah. i was gonna wear mine my regular <laughs> prescription but there was such a glare and dennis doesn't even care about the glare i no, don't dennis. care i like the glare yeah, I live for the glare. <laughs> He's glaring. Anyway, it, it was so exciting to be on stage with you, Ricky. And, you too, man. And I love all of the stuff that you're doing to help out people that are in need. And uh, you pulled through. You're a survivor and passing it on in a good way. I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, your personality and your remarks. And uh, hopefully we get to play together again. And maybe we yeah. can do something even more serious and, and do some songs together or something. I don't know about go. serious, but I'd love to do stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, serious is, as serious album. as I can get. Yeah, yeah. right. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, Dennis, thank you very much for coming on. We do have to uh, send out a thank you for you for sort or setting up this podcast and getting right. Ricky on, as well as Carol. Big shout out to Carol Kay. And thank both of you guys for uh, bringing Ricky on. But uh, we'll talk to you again, okay, Dennis? And we'll uh, have you on the show. I love your show, Ryan. Thanks a lot, Dennis. Bye bye. Hey, Dennis. Coming on. See you in a bit. Cool. Well, there, there was your big surprise moment. Nice. I mean, it came. I, I was going to come later in the podcast, but then I figured, you know what? We're, we're, we've already started talking about, um, you know, Dennis and. You, well, you, and you're our, showing the picture so fast. Yeah, he, I'd explain each one of them, but you keep going on to the next thing. <laughs> well, that's that's Vic, our producer. So you you can give him shit as well, because I, <laughs> I I I I pile on him every single time, and then the chat defends him, and that's the way it goes. But just, uh, we're going to talk about we get to that, just, just a yeah. quick thing. We were talking about. Super Susan, that was my first national tour, and we opened for Graham Parker and The Rumor, um, which um, was on their Squeezing Out the Sparks tour, right? And, uh, you know, being a guitar player, uh, you understand that um, Brinsley Schwartz was his guitar player, right? Brinsley Schwartz, who had a band. That's So that goes back to all the bands that I learned about through Melody Maker and Sounds, mm, British magazine. Radio, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, so I would watch his guitar playing every night because he was, you know, if you listen to Graham Park in the room, like, down, 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 local girl, he was very much about playing melodies. So I learned a lot from Brinsley Schwartz. And that was my first national tour. And we played all across the country and it was fabulous. I love it. Well, you know what? Let's take a quick break right now. Uh, this is our sort of halfway point. If you're cool to hang out for a little bit longer, we have uh, a couple other segments to go. There's, I promise you, there'll be more animation, uh, folks. We are hanging. Aren't out I here. animated enough? <laughs> hanging out with guitarist Ricky Bird, Hall of Famer Ricky Bird, and right now I think we're going to hit the commercial, Vic. That has. Uh, let's talk about Hughes and Kentner this week, and we can uh, run that commercial, and then we'll come back with a little bit of "Let the People Speak." Okay. Hello, Ryan Roxy here. And I get a lot of questions lately regarding the current guitar amp setup that I'm using. Well, here's the answer. It's the Hughes & Kettner Black Spirit 200 floor model. Because it's roughly the same size as a compact pedal board, it can fit on any stage or desktop easily. But don't let the size fool you. Inside is packed with a 200 watt power amp, a ton of presets and programming options, built-in Redbox Direct technology, plus all the built-in effects you'd want. And the secret behind the tone? Well, that's the Bionic Spirit Tone Generator, which is fully programmable on the amp by using its built-in Bluetooth to connect to the app, which works seamlessly with both iPad and Android devices. But probably the best thing about the Black Spirit 200 is that it's easy to use. 
With its user-friendly setup, I managed to get a great tone going within just a couple of minutes of plugging in. If you're looking for that perfect, compact, all-around amp that covers you in the studio, on the stage, and even live streaming, this is the one. Check out the links for the Hughes and Kentner Black Spirit below or in the description, and let's get rolling. Speaking of rolling, on with the show. And I'm magically back with a different outfit change. How about that? A moment for our sponsors. (laughs) <laughs> well here you know what i'm feeling a lot better about this week's show because last week when we ran that commercial basically my internet went down and i had a hard time from this part on out hearing what who my guest uh we had the great teddy zigzag uh I played with teddy yeah a I did one of those events with him oh man there you go well we i talk about the guitar journey i want to talk about and i believe the year is like 1987 that's where you start another important journey of yours that you're still on today, the sobriety recovery journey, basically, yeah. and, and all the work that you've put into it now. Because now, is this, am I right about it being about 87? Sorry? Uh, that's exactly right. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I started um, using, uh, you know, uh, pot, really, you know, when I was 13, like most teenagers back then. Um, you know, but I, I, ha- I have... Uh, uh, the disease issue of, of addiction and alcoholism. My dad had it, his father, you know, they both died from it. Um, so what started out as fun and games uh, turned into something more serious as time went on. And, and by the end, I, I had done uh, too much uh, of everything too often. And uh, I guess by the grace of God and, and a bunch of help, uh, I got out before it was too late, you know? So September 25th, 87 was my last bit of anything uh and and since then i've been um i only recently and when i say recently i mean like this is 21 maybe 2008 ish nine i started getting into doing stuff that had something to do with recovery musically um and that turned into a whole you know a a a whole thing where i go to treatment facilities around the country um i do recovery music groups oh there i am that's in. Uh, that's a great place in Patterson, New Jersey, that I've been going to once a month for the last three years, and I miss going there. It's uh, it's crazy. But um, and I'm a you know I'm a speaker at events and stuff like that, and I'm just trying to spread the music. I mean I'm 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 lucky. I, I stumbled into combining the music, um, with with the message. By right. it was like by accident. Like I wrote this one song with my friend Richie Supa. Uh, who's a great songwriter who co-wrote like Amazing with Steven Tyler and this and that. And um, uh, I, I came back to New York. I wrote it with him in Florida. I came back to New York. I put it online. Uh, just I did a quick demo of it. I put it online. I started getting messages from all over the world. People saying, oh, you told my story, right? So in turn, I wrote a second song and I wrote a third song and this and that. Um, and I, when I had about six or seven songs, um, and at the same time, I'm doing those events I talked about, like the one in Boston at the treatment facility. Exactly. Um, I, I, I kind of reached out to a treatment f- uh, a, a facility uh, that I met, met the people in Florida when I did a, like a recovery gig down there. And, and, I, and I said, um, I know you have some places up in New Jersey. What if I came with my acoustic guitar and did like a recovery music group? Not having a clue what the fuck I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, they said fabulous. So I started doing that and I had like six or seven songs. I kept writing more. And I kept getting the response from the people, the clients, like you're looking at, where do we get this music? How can we take it home? So that led to doing the Clean Getaway record, which came out in 2013, which is a pretty rocking record. Um, in fact, I have like uh, Bobby Whitlock on, on one track, on the blues track, Clean Getaway, which is pretty cool from Derek and the Dominoes. Well, it, it definitely should be noted that you've had four solo albums out, uh, Tough Room, uh, This World, Lifer, and then Clean Getaways, where you start- uh, right sort of putting in more sobriety inspired songs. But folks, I got to tell you, and I listened to it, especially with the new one, which was going to, you know, sort of dovetail us into the newest release, which is Sobering Times. It's not uh, any of these uh, songs don't ever feel like you're being preached at. Yeah, it's not my thing. When you have like Christian rock bands, sometimes you almost feel like you're you're at a you're at church or you're getting and, and it's almost okay. Christian rock doesn't be it. There's a stigma to it when you hear that message getting forced on you at some point. But there's some bands that do it great. Switchfoot started out; they've had a great run at sort of 
giving their message and having a great rock sound. But your message of sobriety, it never feels preachy. And it just, the album fucking rocks, especially the new well, Sobering Times. I really like it. Well, the, 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 uh, um, the rules are the, the records have to rock. That's the first rule. Nothing goofy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hate goofy. And, um, and B, no preaching allowed. So, so the deal is um, the music is just what you'd expect out of me. And the lyrics, I mean, it's a conscious effort to, for me to write a song that people won't go, oh, geez, really? Do you, must you? you know, so I, the message is in there. And, and, and on the Sobering Times record, this new one that came out in September of last year, um, uh, like a limited release, it's, that's, uh, we'll get to that. Okay. Um, I, I even said, you know what, let me try to get, and it's, it's also business. Like, it's like, let me even like make the, the road wider. So you, if you, if you're in recovery or you're struggling with addiction, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you're not, it's just a great rock and roll record, you know? So hopefully I can get it played on more places. I mean, I, I get played little, little Steven, uh, I just had like the coolest song in the world and they're playing a second song, quitting time. That's open sobering times. Yeah. So I just try to, um, I'm trying to spread the message. How do I know I'm succeeding? Well, because I get uh, messages on social media from people that buy the records and say, man, that was like, you, you hit it on the head, bro. You know, like that, that's, that's exactly what I was going through. It's great that there's a solution. It's great. I don't have to live like that anymore. Um, and not everything is, is, um, like just straight, straight, uh, to the bone. You know, it's like, I, I kind of like go around a little bit, you know, and it's just, just about, like the musical styles on the album, to be honest with you. Uh, well, that's because- great because see, these are, you call them solo records. Lifer was a solo record. Tough room. This world was recorded live. It's like lo-fi at the bitter end with Simon Kirk on drums and, and Kazim Sultan on bass. Um, and I was, I just recorded that to get gigs, but we turned people liked it. So I started selling it. <laughs> um, Lifer is really my first solo record. Like that's when I finally said, okay, you know what? You know what I sound like who I am? I'm a combination of everything I grew up on. That's what Lifer is. These two records are, are basic. They're, 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 you know, my, my records, but they're concept records, really. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. There, there's a yeah. story in there. And, um, I'm just uh, like, am I going to do another one like that? I don't know. Like, I just wrote two new songs. I haven't written since I finished writing for this record. And finally, something came to me. You know, I get, I just dry up. I understand. And, um, no, I, yeah. I understand that drought. I understand that's that that writer's drought. Yeah, man. and I don't push it because I'm pushing this record. Right. Um, and then I, I got two cool songs, and and it's about it's about the same kind of stuff, but it's about. Um, I think I just can't write stuff about. Um, you know, driving in cars and I don't know, you know, the usual. Well, you've got a, you've got a good message to put out there. And like I said, you have the spectrum of music that you're able to draw from uh, gives the listener a lot to uh, take in. And like, just as far as styles, like, again, you're great. It's awesome that uh, the, the underground garage gives you so much love. It, it's a great opportunity to be on that station. And and I'm sure you, you and little Stevie, Stephen have history as well, but uh, quitting time again and again uh, together, the second song, I think on the, on the album, it, it has almost a rock and roll part two Gary glitter vibe. That's on purpose. And that's why I got Tommy price to play drums on that. Perfect. Perfect. Um, th- then if, if I go on, if you know, I mean, folks, I did listen and I turned all, my whole crew on to this album this week. And I sent, I sent the link. I said, you guys just listen to this album. A lot of great guitar tones, a lot of great songs, uh, tired. One of the tracks off that, uh, bit of a Georgia satellites, if, if you will. Yeah. Faces, yeah. just faces, you know, recover me, which is, you know, a great sort of way to, to sort of circumvent the issue and stuff. And that's a duet with my pal, Willie Nile. It to me, it had a bit of a Michael Monroe Hanoi Rocks vibe. Oh, to cool! It. Straight ahead, so I, I loved it, you know. And and Mike Monroe's been on the podcast before, so we love having him. Um, and then you got these songs, uh, "Ain't Gonna Live Like That," it's like oh, straight up that. blues rock, right? Yeah, blues rock. And those people at the end that you hear in the gang vocals, those are people from a treatment facility I was working out because I'm also a certified like a counselor and a recovery coach. I haven't done much work at it uh, for you know this reason that's going on now. And also uh, I, I'm, I'm doing so many other things that I can't really commit to a place, but now I can. Um, so that those gang vocals that I grabbed, I called the place I was at 
uh, working at and I said, hey, could give me like 13, 13 of the, the, the people I work with out there, the clients, and have them come out to the studio and I'll get them on the record. So that's Thank them you. shouting, I ain't going to live like that no more, no more, you know? I love Straight it. up blues. Now, um, of course, we're going to give your contact links of where they can find the album, but it's, it's, it's basically at the... Uh, because you talked earlier about it being a release in 2020, but hey, 2020, what a great year to have a release, right? So you're going to re-release it or re, uh, throughout the year. But well, what what actually happened? Site, what, right? what actually happened? Yeah, we're having a contest right now because okay. I have like like ten sobering times CDs left to my name, you know. Oh so uh, <laughs> I had to go back to the printing shop. Yeah, I mean it was it was 1999, but um, you know if somebody buys the Sobering Times record, they they get entered into a contest that's going to end March 1st, and and I'll pick a name out of a hat and they get a signed Sobering Times CD. Uh, um, it's tough room this world. Okay, the, the, so from the first from the first solo albums. Okay, got it. Got yeah, so so uh, the deal is that and we put the record. I finished the record right right around the beginning of the pandemic. Like I just made it. I had to do some mixing, like mastering by phone, uh, like little little things that you like just- you're kind of, on the phone listening to it and saying, hey, I need this or- Well, what? it's actually, what's fabulous is, is I guess it's, I don't know if it's a new software, but my co-producer, Bob Stander, I do all my records out at uh, Parcheesi Studios in Huntington, Long Island. Nice um, plug. He, he, um, he said, no, no, we could listen to it in real time now. There's this new software. So, you know, there was a couple of internet jiggles, but all in all, it was the kind most of cool. part it worked all right, huh? Like he was mixing and I, and, I, and then I'd say, no, stop. And I'd say, no, make the guitar a little lower there. Or, you know, as opposed to him sending me mixes and then me having to write a thing and send it back to him. So it, we finished it. And then I put it, I said, listen, we got to put it out. And then as we already announced, we were putting it out September 25th, which is my 33rd sober anniversary. Um, and to, to just sell it on my website, rickybird.com. That's where you could purchase it right this minute. Um, I, got, I signed a distribution deal, right, that came out of left field, right? So it's, uh -huh. it's BFD, um, Sony, The Orchard. Right distribution. So you go through go through it, so you'll have an official release later in 2020. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be. I think they're releasing the first single uh, uh, this month, end of this month, one in March, and then they're gonna and it's released worldwide in stores, online, and physical in April. So that's gonna be. So my thing was like a limited release. It's like my social media release. You know, okay. now this is gonna be the. Yeah, which is cool. It kind of extends the inner everything. circle release, and now you're going to go out to, right. to to the broader public. And so the everybody. the way it's going to work is if you want to buy if you want to buy the CD, you know, you'll get it online at Amazon, all Play. If you want a signed copy, you come to my my rickybird.com. There you got it. There you go. That makes sense. Makes all this. You know what? I'm going to take some notes down and maybe do that with my next record as well. Um, we you got a lot of stuff going yeah, put on. Put it There's out there. Put it out during a, a pandemic and a and a, a big election. That's what you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> Won't get overlooked at all. So. But you know what is not overlooked is our next segment because there's more there's more uh, friggin' animation because it's now time, folks. One of your favorite parts of the show where the uh, we compile a bunch of questions that have come in through actual uh, viewers and the people uh -oh. that are in the chat room right now. It's time for In the Trenches. We're here with Ricky Bird. Harry uh, King Show. Let the people speak. Come on, folks. <laughs> Oh, there you go. That's it. It's it's this small little animation. That's it. I love it. Um, so, and, and and trust me, there's no budget in it as well. So, let no the people budget in anything anymore. <laughs> Not at all. Do people still use the word budget? <laughs> no. I think Dennis Dunaway's uh, eyeglass collection has a budget. He yeah. spends a lot of money on them. Last time he had a different pair of glasses on as well. So, let the people speak. Our first question is for. Guitarist Ricky Bird. It comes from at Tay Jerosher. Most memorable riff you've ever heard or ever written? Huh. My favorite guitar, you know, let's not say favorite, but um, the riff to all the young dudes. Yeah, Ian Hunter, right? Yeah, Mick Ronson, right? Mick Ronson. Maybe Bowie. Did, do you think Bowie came up with that? He probably hummed it. Yeah, maybe. I, I don't know the back history. I'll ask I'll ask Ian the next time I talk to him. But you know, I got that as a kid that 
there's a few things, there's a few riffs and or melodies that make me tear up. That always does it. Also, the riff in uh, Rhapsody in Blue. Ba -da 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 oh, hair on the arms. Just go straight up. <laughs> now, I think there's some sort of scientific chemical reason why some riffs and or some melodies affect people. But yeah. I'm going to say all the young dudes, of course. Um, uh, so we're talking about my generation, right? So you're my talking about Mississippi Queen. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about Start Me Up. You know, True. you, you know yeah. all those the stuff that that you, as soon as you heard it, you went like a dog, right? Like when he hears that, whoop, you know. <laughs> if I can be so bold, Ricky, I'd say down, down, da down, 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 yeah. down, down. I mean, I love rock and roll. Amazing guitar riff, and written by um, my friend Alan Merrill, um, who uh, unfortunately passed very early on in this pandemic oh, yeah, no. from this, mm. um, and he wrote that song. And you could go and find the arrows uh, and look at the original version of that song. Um, so, yeah, it's a great riff. It's simple. Simple. It's, it's radio. Power. Immediately you know. comes on recognizable. And is, uh, is that is that your your track on that? Or is that a combination of you and Joan? No, it's or? both of us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that was that my – I joined the band right before, like, uh, you know, starting to record that record. That's right. when I joined the Black Hearts. That's, yeah. oh, I and think that was, that's a pretty that was pure, good luck sign. That was pure Marshall. Yeah. Marshall like, like, and Les Paul. Yeah, and Kenny Laguna would just like triple track the, the guitars and stuff. Damn. I love that riff. All right. All right. So all the young dudes, you got to check it out. I like, you know, and it's another New York guy, and I'm not sure if you know him, if you have history with him. Adam Baum did a version yeah. of all the young dudes on his solo record, and I liked his version as well. Yes, Bowie wrote all the young dudes for Mata Hoople. I'm reading that. And we they were Mata Hoople was having no success. They were about to break up and Bowie came in with that song and said, "Try this song." So, go. thank God for David for that it's, and many it's other. It's one of things. those classic guitar guitar changes too that that descending, you have a chord and then it just descends like half, but you know. Yeah. It's and 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 let me say, I got to so we played so I'm touring with him and we're in England. We finished the Scandinavian tour. And we're in, in London playing and, you know, Ronson had just passed recently and people had, they were all dressed with top hats, like the Mata Hoople thing with, we love you, Mick, you know, all that stuff. And, and there I'm up on the stage. So here's a little backstage story, not backstage, but, you know, <laughs> behind the music. So there was a live Ian Hunter record where um, whoever was in the band, it might've been Ronson, but I'm not sure, played this riff really low. Like, and then you hear Ian go louder, and the whole band kicks in. <laughs> well, we he did that when we played in um in Scandinavia, and we we're in front, so there was a lot of emotion going on that night because there was all these McRonson fans. He had just passed. Here I am, mm. you know, being the guy on guitar, which was you know was treacherous to me in my brain. Mm. And then once I started that riff and he said louder, I got really emotional and had to like go, Oh god, breathe. <laughs> you know, but um, breathe and, is what you say right before you're gonna yeah, you, you get tear eyed up, and I, I, I go I, to when I'm getting emotional. Yep, you did it at the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame speech. I, I, I you, you got almost. Well, I, bit, yeah, was, I started talking about a little bit touring, there. touring with Jet because we yeah. were like brother and sister, like out on the road. You know, like we were best friends out there playing all the time, and we were in all the trouble together and on stage together and sweating together. You know what I mean? But um, good first guitar riff. I how about this one? How what's the first guitar riff you learn? Rock and roll guitar riff. Take a uh, guess. Well, I would smoke in the water. Yes. <laughs> Come on. I swear. <laughs> it's 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 pretty much the, the to this day the standard. My son. Look at that. Look at that. Oh wow. Well, this might dovetail into our next question. Um, uh, at Bellinger uh, writes, "What was the?" For song you learned on guitar. Well, there you go. That you just put that up. Okay. But wow. I did play. Vic, you're killing me over here, buddy. See that that's my first acoustic. That guitar is now in the rock hall. I gave that to them. Oh, it doesn't look like that anymore because it was in Hurricane Sandy down here and the top kind of peeled off a little bit. But that's my first guitar. But um and and I got that guitar weeks after I saw the Stones and the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show and I asked my mom for a guitar. So see the I whole thing. I just saw it because I was there in 2019. When was the last time you went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Uh, I did a recovery around. event uh, two summers ago with uh, 
um, Genya Raven and uh, Kathy Valentine from the Go Go's and Lib. Of course, nice. So, so you know, my our stuff is you know how they keep switching the the um, exhibits. So my guitar is not out right now. It's in it's in storage down there. They have this great, you know. Okay. All right. Well, I, I I think I saw a lot of stuff. I definitely saw some some uh, Black Heart stuff. And I they saw always bring my guitar out when I'm when I'm playing now. <laughs> they put it in the exhibit for me. But the I first Alice's you know, boots there. Yeah. yeah. What I started to say was, um, I remember playing "Happy Together" by the Turtles in in PS seventy three in the Bronx. So that I I'm gonna say that, and I'm not saying I did it well because I probably didn't even know more <laughs> than a chord and a half. One. But um, I played it with that guitar, PS73 in the Bronx, um, and that probably predated uh, Smoke on the Water. I, I have to there believe. Well, the Smoke on the Water. I mean, do you do you still have? Do you have your guitar with you? Or you? No, no I don't. They're all. I mean, they're all there over there. I learned it with power chords, but now I just recently realized that it's actually done on you know you know on the fourth, you know, yeah, you're yeah. doing it with the different type of things. Cause I've watched some YouTube. Now you have YouTube to go check and, out. And, all, and stuff like, um, uh, Mississippi queen. I mean, that was one of the first riffs I learned. And, um, you know, you tried to learn theme for the manager theme for an imaginary Western, the mountain song, but that was a little difficult. Yeah. It's the, difficult, the chord difficult changes. To pronounce. <laughs> well, actually the chord changes are kind of all the young dudes, the descending line. There when it is. The wagon leaves the city. You know what I mean? Same thing. Well, I By the way, it's the descending line. Love it. Your voice is killer on uh, on Sobering Times, the new album as well. Thank I just you. wanted to put that out there because turns out um, I can it, sing. Well, I mean, you've been singing for, for for all this time, but damn, it it really shines on this album. And uh, you know, folks, got to go check it out. I, I kind of grew. I grew into my voice. You know the key to singing, bro. It's like writing the songs in the right key. Yeah, you you write the, and and that's where I discovered when I moved to Sweden. I had never played with a capo in my life, but I moved to Sweden and I and I a bunch of musicians that I played with. For one, they all wanted to tune to E standard, you know, four forty tuning. So my voice wasn't built for that. I'm kind of like a almost. A, a step lower at least a half step when we tour with alice right but so then i started just using a capo and then i, I was like oh wow if i put the capo on the fifth fret and write a song out and have the other guitar player play regular oh i love I doing that. sing it perfectly you know yeah that's how i record <laughs> i'm always like uh, my first guitar has got capo all the way up here and then i do another one in regular tune that's how you get the different sounds but like i always say man i could sing uh every steve marriott riff not in his key <laughs> <laughs> Who can? <laughs> I know. I love it. Well, let's move on. And, and if, if Vic's not going to put it up, then I'll ask him now. It's the uh, at Cooper Eyes uh, says, do you have a pre-show ritual? Well, uh, you know, since I've been on my own for so long, I used to listen to, this is going to sound funny, but it's true. I would listen to um, either Sam Cooke live at the Harlem Square Club or I would listen to Frank Sinatra live at the Sands. That's my wow. backstage to get me into that thing. I got, to, I got to stay at the Stand. I love the Sands Hotel before they tore it down, but it was a cool yeah. hotel. So those two nice. albums for a long time were my every Not night. That. Every time I had a gig, I would listen to that in my hotel room. Oh, and there's also, also like, you know, if I'm if I was on the road or something like that, there would always – what, what did we do, bro? We, we brought like a, a boom box, right? On the road with us. Now I got everything. I'm, I got like 5,000 songs on my phone. On like your 10, phone, 000. yeah, yeah, yeah. But you'd bring was a boom box. Was there a designated box. DJ? Yeah, was there a designated DJ that would be there for the show? Oh, yeah. We always, with Joan, we always came on to Won't Get Fooled Again every night okay. for 10 years. <laughs> but, um, uh, and you knew exactly when you had to get serious and it was time to go start walking to the stage, the Keith Moon drum solo. That was when there I was starting to hustle him. But um, also, Exile on Main Street was a big hotel room song for me. You know, great, like great like during the day, like when it was getting close to going to the gig, I would listen to Exile on Main Street. It's a long album, though. That's a that's a you get it. Well, I didn't listen to it on early. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll move on to Ed Daniel Liledi uh, has a for a question. Let the people speak. How do you get the best guitar tone? Well, we've given you some uh, tricks already. There's a lot of uh, RGA members in the chat right now, but uh, Capo is one of them. And uh, Ricky, give us some of your some of your uh, tricks. Well, 
Yeah, I don't have any tricks. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a big, um, like I have like a pedal board with your basic stuff. Like I got a great delay pedal. I got a great overdrive. Well, the overdrive pedal, you know, and maybe you could uh, confirm this with what I'm saying. A guitar play, like it's easy to get a good delay pedal. It's it's easy to get a good, you know, uh, uh, reverb pedal. It's easy. The overdrive pedal, dude, Find you spend your whole career one. trying to get Eric Clapton's blues breaker sound, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like yeah. because what happens is when you start using a lot of this stuff, it changes your sound. You know, because all I want is is my guitar just with some hair on it. You know, that's all you'd yeah. get doing with an, an overdrive pedal, right? But yeah. it's it's very very difficult to find. I and mean, everybody has their favorite thing. I've got like thirty of them, and it's like, yeah, I like that one for a while. I like that one for a while. But it's always to try to get Clapton sound on the blues breakers. Like I said, I have a five hundred dollar Epiphone uh, Flying V that there's pictures of. I'm sure you showed. Yeah, I, I put some. I put some. Um, um what are those gibson pickups called um burst buckers or something like that yes that's what i put in yeah burst buckers i had the electronics because that's the only thing on an epiphone is not as, some, yeah yeah you put it's not as good as a, a proper gibson and okay. dude i plug that into my fender uh pro deluxe 15 watts there's nothing in between yeah i got my pedal board but even if it's straight Oh, this this dude there's two there's three knobs on the there's it two knobs on the on the amp yeah. you know tone and volume and you just yeah. turn that baby up and that's the best sound i could ever get you know i like that that epiphone v because that's more of a karina v that's what it is copy yeah, yeah. and like you know that. people said oh because i remember it dude i was i wanted to get a flying v i just said yeah i, I need like an albert king thing going on and so i called gibson you know and i said like how much would it cost me for a flame beam? Oh, we can get you one from the custom shop, like seven grand. I'm like, what are you freaking high? You know what I could buy for seven grand? You know, like four acoustic guitars and three, you know. So so uh I called my friend at Chelsea Guitars uh, on twenty third street. Dan. Right. Yeah. And I said, Hey, you got a flying V? And he says, I got the greatest Karina, it was it was in the, the like the the good uh, factory in Korea, which I don't even know what it means, but you know, obviously for guitar, like people that are really into that, they pay and, the workers. I don't know. I don't like, know what it is. You know, <laughs> everybody. This is the one you want. This guitar. How much? Five hundred bucks. Put my name on it. <laughs> you know. No. It's... And, and I, that's it. I just got some burst buckets from Gibson. I, I changed the electronics out, and I love this guitar. There you go. So that's part of getting that tone. As far as overdrives go, you know. Yeah. I, for years and years, uh, I, did, I relied on just an MXR microamp that was only just a little bit of a boost, give me a little bit more gain. And now I've changed to a spark plug. That's the name of the, of the uh, pedal, but it's made by TC Electronics. So it's, and it doesn't really give you too much distortion. It just gives you a little bit more like a volume boost, if you will, you know? Yeah. But, I, and that's the key. Maybe a volume boost is, is the better way to go. It's just... You know, I got all the usual suspects, man. You want a you little know? gain, though, just a little bit. I know, but everybody, here's the thing. Everybody always says, oh, you got to get that original Ibanez tube yeah, screamer. Yeah. And then I do it, and my guitar sounds like someone just put an ice pick up my nose. Yeah. And, you, yeah. Know, you know, even worse up my nose. And that's I, I, nothing but high end. <laughs> and I always like it for a while, and then I say, what else is there? I remember at the Rock Hole, Doyle Bramall had the, a really great sound. And he explained it to me. It was... See, I don't know the names of these things. <laughs> he he said um, it was like 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 a, a homemade version of the, you know, what's that one everybody uses that that really expensive overdrive thing that everybody's like, oh, it's okay. the boutique thing, sampling? or is it just is it a pedal? Yeah, it's a pedal. Oh man, I, yeah, I, it's I, like I, you can get one on eBay for like eight grand or something. It's like we, you know, wow. And I'm like, dude, I, I just give me a. Freaking boss pedal or something. Just sing along. <laughs> Does Epiphone make that pedal? Because I'll buy that one. <laughs> yeah, it's like I, I I don't know. Like I keep trying stuff. I mean, I got the amp and the guitars. Yeah, happening. Hey. And then if I just need a little a little stuff, I I, I use this use one. I know my delay. I got that MXR um, the green one that I love. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. always served me well. And I got right. like a um. I like having like the fake Leslie thing. That's cool. That's a great sound. That's a great sound. Yeah. I mean. 
Actually, uh, Hughes and Kentner made the best uh, sort of Leslie pedal ever. It was called a Rotosphere, I believe, um, and uh, it's it's sort of a classic now. But yeah, the Roto. You know, yeah, I love with, that. With the with the Hughes and Kentners that I'm using now, it has basically all the effects built in. It's got some great delay. I don't really like like you. I try to keep it kind of minimal, but it's got a boost in there as well. So I like I like having a little. And, and you can hear on the record. Um, I I mean everything. I'm going straight into the amps. I you know I use little Fenders and maybe a Supro because everything's at Bob's house. I don't even bring anything. He's got all this great gear. Um, and, um, and then we screw around, you hear this, we put a little roto vibe on it, or we put a little this, maybe once I'll use a little bit of a wah. I don't know if I use wah in sobering times, but I'm, I'm, I'm more interested, you know, like I try to use, like you, you'll hear things on sobering times and you go, oh man, that reminds me of, uh, so-and-so with a Roxy music record, that little bit where it goes, or this, remind I do that on purpose. Like, I, I just want to be thrilled like I was when I was 14. Like, I just like the weird stuff. I like at the end of one song, there's like, you know, it goes into this kind of like Beatles, like, you know? Yeah. It's it's all ear candy, you know? And it's well, hard, But as far as pedals and sounds, I'm more interested in writing a really great song. Like, like I know my friends like G.E. Smith, he knows like which screws they used on the 59 <laughs> Les Paul. It's like, I have no idea and yeah. I don't care, you know? <laughs> I just want to write really good songs and, you know, I just went down a little bit of a YouTube rabbit hole while I was doing research for this uh, show today. And it was a Tony Visconti uh, video about uh, recording. Uh, I think it was heroes and right. they recorded the bass with the uh, flanger effect on it. And he said, ah. we did that on purpose because we didn't, because, you know, the written rule is, you know, you always record everything dry yeah. because no, back in those days, we wanted to commit to a yeah. vibe. That's a good and, way to look at it too. And so they, you know, if you, you break down the tracks, you hear this bass, you know, this bass part, this iconic bass part of heroes and the drums, and it's completely flanged out, but then it, it provides the whole foundation right. for the vibe of the song. Well, you, me and Bob stand up work fabulous together. Like, he he's um i just tell him you know that thing that that vocal thing that plant did on you know the pre-delay delay thing oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and then yeah that, let's put that right there like I, i'm good at explaining it he knows how to get it but like for one song i don't know if it was on this and he plays bass on everything because he's just a fabulous musician um i don't know if it's on sobering times or clean getaway but you know it's a i said dude like distort the hell out of that bass what do you mean grand funk it I want to hear like Grand Funk. <laughs> so my references are all like you know, stuff I listened to when I was a kid. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we have one more question from there, which which actually goes into that. From Is Gills back from Let This People Speak? Uh, who were your main inspirations when you first started playing? And do you have any new sort of bands that you would like to sort of give us some um, hype on? Um, 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 um. Leslie West was a a big uh, influence on my guitar playing when I was 14, 15. Okay, so let's start right there. Um, Keith Richards, of course, for rhythm. And um, Albert King is like my favorite. And Albert King and Albert Collins are like yeah. the two guitar players that really do. I love, of course, I love B.B. King and everybody else, but Albert something about Collins. Albert King, bro. Yeah, yeah. And Albert Collins, man, he, he, you know, he capoed up here on the 12th fret or something, and then he tuned, tuned to E minor, you know, and that was his whole style, right? Oh, I used to go see him at the Roadhouse in New York City. Yeah. A, you know, he used to play at the, I guess it used to be old studio up on 54th Street, but I'm not drunk, I'm just drinking. And yeah. uh, I remember really right, we were on, a, we were somewhere in the Midwest or I don't know, somewhere. And he was checking out as we were checking in, and I freaked out. And he was the nicest. He says, come on the bus, man. Let's hang out a little while. He was like the nicest guy. <laughs> Albert King was a bit of a, um, a curm curmudgeon. Maybe I am too now. Um, <laughs> Do we I remember curmudgeon? seeing him at the Lone Star Cafe. And, and you know, in between sets, first of all, he screamed at his drummer the whole night, which freaked me out. Oh. And then we went upstairs to the, up, the little room, uh, the overhang there, the balcony in between sets and he was sitting alone at a table with like a scotch or something and i said to the bartender man you think i can go over and say hi to him he said yeah you know he might be fine <laughs> and then he might not and i started to walk towards his table and he looked up and gave me stink eye like 
nobody's business. And I just turned right around and went back to the bar. And I was like, <laughs> he's like, no, I'm good. He better left. But they his guitar playing, he could take one note and bend it 12 ways, you know, it. as opposed to taking 12 notes and, bend, and bending it one way. <laughs> so uh, I'm more, I'm more into minimalistic guitar playing. Like right. I appreciate, you know, all the, 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 the shredding and stuff like that. It's not my thing. Like I, I like Mick Ronson. Like I like what you could do with the least amount of notes, you know, Wow, Good I've way. always been like that, and I always will be like that. Any new guitarists? Any new bands that you sort of say, "Hey, this oh is cool," God, and it doesn't matter because because new bands to me are ten years old. I, <laughs> I'm not really familiar with anything at this point, but I did see like when a song hits me, I'm what? Whoa, whoa, that was good. On okay. SNL last weekend, Nathaniel Radliff is that how you pronounce his name? Uh, He's, chat room it, let me know <laughs> yeah i think it's rad it's not rad our, our rad, producer rad vic is saying yes because our vic our producer vic has his finger on the pulse of all things that are Dude, he did young. a song and he's just like a you know a regular guy you know um and he did a song called set me free that i was just like oh that's good songwriting right there like i am when i hear a good song you know i, I get that's impressed awesome. You know, well, like I said, I heard a lot of them on Sobering Time. So, folks, well, again, go check out that, that record. And I'm going to do, give you one last little animation piece because I worked hard on it this afternoon. And I feel that it's a great question because we have a segment of the show called um, The One That Got Away. And this is about either a piece of gear uh, that you wish you still had or that you had to sell it or you lost it or it was stolen. So, Vic, if you want to run this amazing, Amazing, amazing animation for one of our last segments of The One That Got Away. Please do it. I just want to listen to that all day. Wasn't that touching? I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, you know, I, I got to take, take a minute. Breathe. Yeah. Make sure you breathe. <laughs> Do you have a piece of equipment, a guitar, an amp, anything that the one that got away? Well, even though I did say that I'm not a big Strat guy, I had a 61 Strat that I got from G.E. Smith back in the early 80s. And you could see it on a lot of, there it is. Yeah, I wish I still had that. I had to sell that in, in a moment of desperation back then. Right. Um, what else? Well, if, you know, the picture of me with my 56 Les Paul, my Leslie West guitar that I got for like, you know, $350 at Manny's Music back in 73 or something. That was a good one. That guitar, I'd like to have that. That was my first electric guitar. That was bought, bought purchased at Lafayette Music wow. on, on, Queen, on Northern Boulevard in Flushing, Queens. And it came with a little lamp, too, with a little light. <laughs> you know, Our producer is so life. happy he gets to use these photos. He was so so. You should have yeah. seen his face in the screen. I can see it. You now, can't. That but guitar. He, that guitar. You could either play like a e down here, yeah, and it was fine, or you could play an E up here, but you couldn't play both because the you know the the neck was so bad. Oh my goodness! It's like you, you could either tune it for up here or down. You know. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I'd, I'd like to have cool. that. I don't know, man. Like I, my Black Les Paul, my my guitar that I used in Susan and with Joan, that's in the Rock Hall. You know, when they put the exhibit up, it's out. Um, I got my blue sparkle Les Paul that I used on you know, all the Blackheart stuff, like Hate Myself for Loving You video and everything. That's like a 75. Yeah, that guy. That guy I got. Um, yeah, don't look like that no more. <laughs> the pick, first of all, the pick guard is gone. And second of all, um, well, I just found the other pickup in a box. You're looking and, like your uncle that used to sell the liquor to uh, yeah, Max's yeah. Kansas City in that shot. Yeah, I, yeah. I look like I was doing deals. <laughs> um the pickup um, the pick art is gone it's all scratched up um i remember les paul came into the studio once when we were recording he looked at the back because hey man it was the 80s i had these giant belt buckles right the les paul yeah yeah the real les paul yeah the les in. paul i love it um and um the whole back of the guitar was scratched from my my 80s freaking rock belts <laughs> <laughs> and he said man we got to teach you how to take care of your guitars you know i have a little bit of that going on right here a yeah. little bit oh uh, yeah I, I think nah, I, I, i'm way past that with that yeah. that black that's well and i'm going to tell you uh that the pickups so there's one humbucker and there's one p90 if i remember that picture you just showed um uh, you put that picture back up Vic. 
I think yes, I painted. This, yeah, it's I, a P90 in the front. Wow. Yeah, I think That's I, cool I configuration. dude, I magic markered one night in a hotel room drunk. I magic markered that pickup black. <laughs> do you wish you had that magic you marker back? If, what yeah, if you had that magic marker? That's the one that got away. <laughs> yeah. I wish I had some time back, but that's not going to happen. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not, I don't get attached to, to, you know, gear. Like I love like hurricane Sandy, right? I got most yeah. of this stuff upstairs. I lost the, 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 you know, amp that I used with Joan, the Marshall. Um, you know, I lost a couple of things. Shit. It's like God spring cleaning, you know, it's just stuff, bro. Yeah. All right. you know? Good for you. Good for you to have that attitude because he's been such a good sport and I've seen him backstage this uh, part of this whole sh entire show. Let's bring on Dennis Dunaway one quick second for the one that got away just so he can actually tell because maybe Dennis has one that got away as he's frantically trying to get new glasses on. I saw him try <laughs> he tried to change his glasses before we got him on in frame. Vic, you can, can you run that uh, animation one more time for the one that got away? No, you can't. <laughs> don't do that anymore we, we put the people through that but dennis do you have a story about any of your bases or any of your base amps the one that got away oh shit now he's on he's on uh, you gotta unmute yourself bro yeah can't un hold on it's the hold sentence on. that's that's the um the, the uh, popular sentence in in pandemic time unmute yourself yeah, yeah. Uh, okay uh uh my son Coliseum bass amp. I mean, that was killer. The early son, uh, uh, that thing was a monster. I had two of them, one on my side of the stage during the B Billion Dollar Babies tour. And I had another uh, another one, the backup amp would be on the other side of the stage that then uh, the guys on that side of the stage had the option of turning it on or off, depending on the room acoustics. But that was a killer amp. It was so loud and it growled so nicely. But then uh, it got when we played down in South America, it never came back. And then the new ones weren't quite the same. Damn, damn. Yeah, well, stuff comes and goes, you know. Yeah, I. I mean, these days I hardly even take an amp with me. I just use whatever is available at the club or something because I'm I'm kind of like Ricky in that uh, respect, where it's more important the notes that you're playing than than the actual equipment. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have some great acoustics, you know, that I still have. I have like a, a '59 uh, or maybe no, maybe it's a '61 or '62 Gibson B25 that I still have. You know. I got stuff, you know, I don't have a, a ton of guitars anymore, you know, not compared to like Joe Bonamassa or anything, but I got yeah. the stuff that I love and, um, and I, everything ones. else is tradable, you know, to me, yeah. like yeah. I'm, what I'm trying to do. I have a 70, I love seventies guitars. Cause that was the era I came up. Right. I have a 70, I have a 73 sunburst, right. That, that I got like four years ago and I'm trying to trade it. I sold a 61 Epiphone Coronet, like my Steve Marriott live at the Fillmore kind of, but it's such a cool one. It has like a medallion, you know, it has the Epiphone um, medallion on the top. And mm -hmm. I, and I, I don't know, I got, I do these things like in a, in without thinking and I sold it. I'm trying to get it trade and get that one back. Cause it was so light. That's another thing, right? Like light means a lot to me now. It means yeah. more. It means more now <laughs> it than it did more. maybe ten years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like this, this seventy-three Les Pauls a little heavy. I got to be honest with you. Well, the well, early seventies yeah. Les Pauls are bricks. What are you talking about? They're yeah, yeah. they're super heavy. Yeah, especially, with, uh, is, is, especially if it's a custom. Right. Well, right. well, try try gluing a couple pounds of mirrors on it. Well, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Did has uh, Ian Hunter ever, ever going to ask for his sunglasses back? <laughs> uh, I love Ian. <laughs> I is. love Ian. Ian. Oh, that yeah. ju that ju speaking of Ian, if there's pictures of me playing, he's playing my junior. That's my junior. Oh, all right. That I, yeah. that I brought. So I that's the '75 Sparkle, and that's my junior that I brought on that tour. And he wanted it. You know, he wanted me to sell it to him. But see, I sold that too. That's every time I run into somebody, they go, "Hey, man, I had that junior for a while." You know, it. And that was a great guitar, but it was a one trick pony. And at that point I thought like I needed something with like more pickups on it or something. Yeah. I have a, I have a junior and it is a kind of a one trick pony, but that, that one trick is such a good trick. <laughs> I know. I, like, I don't know what I'm thinking, like, you know, but hopefully somebody's making great music with it, you know? Well, well I have three 1970 Shit. Fender jazz bases. 
Yeah, three 1970 Fender Jazz basses. Wow. So guess which year Alice Cooper could afford equipment. <laughs> right, exactly. This has turned into a little bit of a guitar porn episode of In the Trenches, folks, and sort of a dog show as well. It's dog porn and uh, guitar porn at meets, but this is oh, actually nice. my, a nice little... It's like a Johnny uh, Thunder, right? Yeah, it's actually a, an Armstrong model. Is it Billy Armstrong? So a double cutaway, but it is that TV oh, yellow, which I mean, it's a it. Johnny Thunder guitar. Of course, it's always going to be a Johnny Thunder's guitar because they're hey, a little yeah. bit. Two years ago, I got into like buying weird acoustic guitars, like cheap like acoustics, because I got like a nice J two hundred. I got my my Hummingbird, you know, uh, my sixty nine you know, Keith Hummingbird, you know. Love but it. um, I bought so I found a uh, mid sixties like Harmony acoustic with uh um not a harmony a um what the hell is it it's got a gumby headstock i saw the gumby headstock i said yeah i, I need that i gotta have that you, you sure it wasn't um uh, who had a gumby guitar i had a, who steve used to have a, a gumby guitar he used to play not, with uh now i'm gonna not a play. harmony it's a um help me they make slide they make like um blues guitars yeah. help dobro? us out dobro not Dobro. Hey, it's right over there, man. I could grab it, but uh, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm bored. Worry. I'm getting hungry. All right. You know what? We're all getting hungry right now. It's I'm 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 six hours ahead of you, so dinner time. I you, you know that happens, folks. So I'm doing this from Sweden. But I just wanted to have you come Wait, you're on in again. Sweden? Yes, I am. I'm in Stockholm right now. That's what we're doing. We had to set up this time, and we get the European audience and the American audience. And uh, dude, I spent, a, I spent a, I spent a week in, in Stockholm one night. <laughs> yeah, it'll do that to you. Let, let, let me tell you, you know, I'll, I'll end with this. When I went on the Ian tour, we had a whole tour book. So, when we, but when we got to Sweden, like the promoter, because this never happened, screwed up. So all the gigs were, were canceled and they had a, re so, okay, either we cancel, we go home or you stay in Sweden for a week and hang out and we'll rebook the tour. We were supposed to do a thing where we would be on a boat and go to different docks in Scandinavia and the crowd would be waiting there. Right. Um, or pirates, one or the other. <laughs> and, and so, so we stayed there for a week and I had the best time in Scandinavia, man. We did the, we did the, um, water festival. There's actually, yeah, a, the, the, there's a YouTube thing of, of there, uh, of that. And, and the guy who was, um, um, Oh, I love this guy. There's a picture. You showed a picture of me and Ian with the guy who was a singer there. Okay, wasn't Steve Clausen? No, 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 not that, no, not, no, not that picture. It was All the right. one with me and Ian back from the tour. But, but um, he can't. He introduced. He says, "From the Bronx, you know, I love it. From the Bronx, Ricky Bad, <laughs> you know, yeah, this guy in the middle." There. I'm flushing. He, he's I'm like he was flushing. a famous. He's a famous like. Well, I don't know if he still is, but um, you know, singer songwriter. Uh, right. God, I can't remember his name all of a sudden. John, Johnny Matt. Thunder's oh, no, kid no. lives here. No, Matt's Rolander. Wow, where'd yeah. you bring that one back out of? Because Some it's of all in here, back in the brain. I love that it's one. Matt, Matt's <laughs> Rolander. He was very cool, very nice guy, very Keith Richards guy, you know. Mm, but it. um, so we stayed there. So you know what I did while I was there? I went to AA meetings every day. How's that? Yeah, I'd go yeah. on. I'd get on a train by myself. I'd find. I'd call up. You know. I'd look in the. You know. I call the operator, and I would go by myself. Uh, that? There's a lot of drinkers in Sweden, so yeah, you're probably not too hard to find a a, a, a meeting anywhere in Stockholm. I, I I had a great time just hanging out, you know. There it is. Well, guess what? Uh, I'm going to say a quick goodbye to our good friend Dennis Dunaway. Uh, thank you for coming on the show, not once but twice. Um, everybody, <laughs> follow up Dennis on all his socials as well, because it is time for heading out to the highway. Uh, Dennis, I know you have some weird sort of Instagram way. You just gave him the hook, Vic, just like that. Hold on, Dennis. Where where do they find you on Instagram so everyone can uh, start following you? Because I know it's not just at Dennis Dunaway. It couldn't be that simple. Uh, is in it? Instagram is cold, cold coffin. Okay. So cold, cold coffin. There you go. Go follow Dennis. Dennis, I'll give you a call later, but thanks again for facilitating this. Thank you, Carol. Uh, oh, sure. Great show as always, Ryan. Ricky, you're you great. You I'll too, see you in a little bit, Dennis. Now, now you give him the hook, Vic. There you go. Give him the hook. So and let me just, let me just say, um, uh, Let's get to the crux of this thing here. Yeah, I want to get you your all your all your sort of contact information that people. Well, can it's all on my. You. you just go on my website. It's all on there. Go, everybody. Here's the deal. I know there's people watching, right? If you want to help out uh, indie music, because I'm just an indie guy, right? I just put out my own records. 
Um, I see on my, like I get alerted when somebody purchases my record. So I, uh, I don't see any right now. <laughs> uh, Maybe it's time. To, yeah. Go to rickybird.com and help me spread the message of recovery and help me, you know, afford to keep doing these music uh, recovery records. And also, you know, when I'm, when, when there's no pandemic, um, I give out copies. Um, I gave out like 2,500 copies of the clean getaway record at treatment facilities around the country. So uh, hopefully I could do it again with this, with sobering times. But uh, if you want to be my friend, go out, go, go on there and purchase my record, rickybird.com. <laughs> it's a good, it, hey man, it's, it rocks. There's no doubt. Hey Ricky, I, I got to thank you so much for coming on. Um, a very interesting conversation. I could go down that rabbit hole with, with equipment. And I'm sure there's a lot of our listeners right now that love that part as well. But we're going to, um, you know, leave it at this for right now. But uh, maybe it keeps the door open for down the road, maybe sometime in 2021, where we meet up somewhere on the road. We could have another chat. And sure. uh, pleasure to have you on. I really, really, really do dig it. Thank you, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate the uh, hospitality. Thank you, Vic. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Vic. And guess what, folks? Uh, next week, we will have another New Yorker on the podcast. Of course, we will be having uh, JJ French of Twisted Sister will be our guest next Tuesday on In the Trenches. It's a busy week here, but you've been listening to a guitarist, producer, and I love what you're saying, recovery oh, troubadour. Yeah, somebody uh, started calling me that, and I'm like, okay. It was sticks. Why not? Yeah. It sticks. Yeah. You know? Well, I'm a troubadour and I'm in recovery and I, so there you go. And folks, he's from the Bronx, Mr. Ricky Bird. Thank you very much for Ladies being on. Ladies and gentlemen, the from the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ricky. Hang out for one second. I'll say goodbye to everyone. Until next time, folks, I'm Ryan Roxy. Enjoy the ride. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy.